Well, we're back in Revelation 2, and we're going to start in verse 8, uh, four verses, 8, 9, 10, 11, uh, with the letter to the church in Smyrna. We may get through that and deal with the church in Pergamum as well, uh, but at least in Smyrna. Let me read Revelation 2, uh, verses 8 through 11. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. So that's what the Lord says to the church in Smyrna. Uh, let me just uh, talk about Smyrna for a little bit. Uh, currently, well, back in the day that this was written, Smyrna was the um, was the commercial center of Asia Minor of of these churches. Um, and currently, Smyrna is uh, has a population of about two hundred thousand people, and it's reported that a third of the people there are Christian. Uh, professed Christians, and so the church has lasted. The church has succeeded. The church has uh, has has thrived there at, at some level. Um, also, uh, a man named Polycarp, who was a, a, a pupil of John the Apostle, who wrote the Book of Revelation. Polycarp uh, was a church leader in the second century, and, and led the church in Smyrna. One of the leaders there, and he was a pupil of John. He he studied under John. Um, I can't imagine the conversations that he had with the Apostle John. Um, and it led to his leadership in the church in Smyrna. Uh, and Polycarp was martyred for his faith in 155 AD. Suffering and martyrdom uh, goes hand in hand oftentimes with following Jesus. We don't understand that in America. Uh, we think when small liberties are threatened that we're suffering um, uh, when compared to what we have suffered as Christians throughout the centuries and in other parts of the world, we know nothing of suffering. Um, uh, so anyway, that's just a little bit about uh, about Smyrna. If you want to look at uh, where the New Testament correlation, perhaps, uh, with what's going on in the church in Smyrna, again, you go to Matthew 13, and the parable of the weeds. This is interesting. Let me just let me just diverge for a moment and jump back to uh, Matthew 13, the parable of the weeds. Uh, in Matthew 13, verse 24, it says, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, um, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to the owner and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I'll tell the harvesters first, collect the weeds, tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring them into my barn. Um, so that parable, uh, we can draw some correlations to the church in Smyrna. You had good seed that was planted, and then the enemy came and planted some bad seed along with it. Uh, seed is used uh, in the New Testament to, to refer to the Word of God. Um, and so you have, you have the Word of God planted, and then bad seed, bad words, in essence, bad doctrine, bad theology planted in the midst of the good seed, and they both grow up together. It's interesting uh, that in the church of Smyrna, what uh, what Jesus says he has against them um, uh, is is that, well, one of the things they do well is they, 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 they don't um, tolerate the slander of those who say they are Jews and aren't, but they're really the tall, they're of the synagogue of Satan. Jesus knew that this was amongst them. This was a part of their what was going on in their church. 
when, when the Bible says there that they say they're Jews, but they're not, they're the synagogue of Satan, uh, that is likely a reference to those who are, who are coming into the church and um, professing the need to not just be Jesus followers, but to be good Jews. And so you had good seed, love Jesus, and you had bad seed, be a Jew. That's the same thing that the that the the, the church had already dealt with in uh, Acts what fifteen of the Council of Jerusalem. Um, what did they have? To, what did Gentiles have to do uh, to truly be followers of Jesus? How much Jew did they have to become? Do they have to get circumcised? Do they have to obey the uh, the dietary laws? Do they have to do all of these things, all of these works? And and many would say that that in Matthew 13, the good seed is the gospel of grace, faith alone. The bad seed is works. It's the same thing we still struggle with today. Um, and Jesus says, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Um, I know that amongst your good seed, there's been bad seed sown. Um, and, and, and the idea that it's faith and anything else um, is of Satan. And so that could be a correlation between uh, Revelation 2, 8, the church of Smyrna, and a parable Jesus taught over in Matthew 13. Uh, but having said that, let me, let me get into this, uh, to the text. Uh, to the church, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last. That title is used uh, throughout Scripture um, uh, and, and throughout Revelation to refer, uh, to, refer to, de to, to, to Jesus. Uh, these are the words of him who died and came to life again. It's Jesus. He says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. But one thing we have to always keep in mind is that Jesus knows, um, he knows. He, he doesn't discover things. He doesn't come to know things. He knows. Uh, it's who he is. Things don't escape his attention. He knows. Uh, you know, when we pray, it's not a prayer of information. Uh, we, we, we ought not pray, God and then explain everything that we want to talk to him about. He knows. Um, and that's comforting. It's comforting that we have an all-knowing God. Not just all-knowing like he knows where everything started, how it started, because he started. Well, he knows our current situation. He knows our current needs. He knows our current obligations. He knows our current situations. He knows. He knows, he knows, he knows. And uh, and so we don't have to go to him trying to convince him of what our situation is. He already knows. And so we go to him with freedom and confidence, and we approach the throne of grace with confidence, knowing there that we'll receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need, of which he's already aware. You know, if he's if he's already aware of it, he can't be surprised by it. And if he's not surprised by it, he's already made, um, he's already taken steps to rectify, to heal, to restore. Because he knows. He says, I know your affliction and your poverty, yet you're rich. How can you be rich though you're in poverty? Plenty of ways. He says, I know your afflictions. Um, the afflictions that they were facing, this is interesting. <clears throat> the afflictions they were facing could have all been avoided. See, there was a political system in place that required the people to give um, to give just even, just a pinch of incense um, on an altar once a year to Caesar. That's all they asked. That was that was their tax. Just one little pinch of incense on an altar in honor of Caesar. It was it was a once a year, very meaningless political gesture, but it was a gesture nonetheless of not just honoring the position of Caesar, but worshiping the man in the position of Caesar. Um, 
honestly, not many people would have ever known that they'd done it. They could have done it in secret. And, and I mean, it wasn't a, it was a huge fanfare for them necessarily. Um, it would not have been a big deal for them to do it outwardly. But it would have been an act of allegiance to Caesar over God. God was very clear. You have no other gods before me. Caesar is not your God. You worship no other gods other than me. Um, and you honor me first. And to do this one little seemingly meaningless act once a year would have would have prevented all kinds of suffering and affliction. Um, and yet they refused to give in even the slightest bit. And they, they chose to remain totally faithful. Um, and, and you know, there, there wasn't, they didn't revolt. There wasn't some great outpouring of, of uh, rebellion um, first Peter two talks about honoring, um, the authorities. Um, and we ought to do that unless the authorities command us to dishonor God. Um, and they respectfully denied the request of the government because it would have caused them to disobey the commands of God. Um, and they suffered for it. I mean, we shouldn't be surprised when uh, we suffer for honoring God's commands. We think, in America, we often think that the laws of the land ought to help us honor the commands of God, and, and that's just not the way this world goes. I think we've been spoiled. Um but uh, but it is becoming very <clears throat> real and very likely that the laws of this land will be in conflict with the commands of God. And we will have choices to make about which we will obey. The laws of the land or the commands of God. And when we choose to obey the commands of God, um, it's very likely that we will suffer because of it. I mean, just look at all through the Bible. It's what's happened. And we are to respectfully, when the laws of the land conflict with the commands of God, we are to respectfully reject the laws of the land. And it's not... This, this is where people have gotten into some into some trouble lately because um, they've made the mistake of thinking that um, when laws are unjust to do away with laws and, and that's not the solution you don't it, it, if laws and systems are unjust you don't do away with the laws or the system you remake you redeem them and so biblical civil disobedience, and it's all through the Bible. It's all through the Old Testament and the New Testament. I mean, you go to Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all kinds of people. You go to Peter in the New Testament, and he practiced civil disobedience um, um, sinfully, and he practiced civil, civil disobedience uh, biblically and in a way that honored God. So it's all through the Bible. But civil disobedience is not, um, is not revolt. It's not rebellion. It's certainly not rioting. Civil disobedience is, is an appeal to a higher authority about a faulty authority. And so what they're doing in Revelation 2 in, the, in Smyrna is they're practicing civil disobedience and appealing to the higher authority of God over a faulty authority of Caesar. Not in rioting, not in rebellion, but just in an honoring of the higher authority that is God over their lives. And as a result, as will happen with us, they're suffering because of it. And Jesus says, I know that. And he goes on. He says, I know the slander of those who say they're Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. We talked about that. 
that there was good seed sown amongst them. And then the, the, the people, the synagogue of Satan, the teachers of the evil one who comes in and says, no, no, it's not just grace, it's grace and works. And, 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 and Jesus tells them in verse 10, don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. And so Jesus says, I'm going to protect you from suffering. He didn't say that. He says, you're going to suffer. And, you know, and, and this is something we have to understand too. That Jesus suffered. He's our model. And if we're going to follow him, we're going to suffer. I mean, that's one of the things Paul prayed. He said, I want you to pray for me. All these things. And he said that I may know the share in the sufferings of Christ. Can you imagine praying that you would share in the sufferings of Christ? And so that, that, that's part of who we are as Christians. And unless we're ready for it, we'll be rocked by it when it happens. Don't be afraid about, uh, uh, about what you're about to suffer. It says, I tell you that the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. What? 10 days? Well... Some say that's not necessarily like 10, 24-hour periods. If you go over to Revelation 13, 7, um, and this is a, what was to come. Revelation 13, 7 says, uh, He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. Now, this is talking about the first beast. So Revelation 13, talking about the first beast uh, that will come. Uh, and he says, uh, actually, let me just start in verse 5. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies to exercise his authority for 42 months. And so he's uh, he's going to be uh, in authority for oh, 42 months. Figure out what that is. Uh, he opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. And so the, the beast will have power over God's people for a time period. Um, let's be clear, though, that this time period, and some would say that in Revelation 2, these 10 days may be referring to this time where the first beast has authority over God's people. But let's be very clear. Though the, 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 the first beast in Revelation 13, and we'll get there in the weeks to come, has power to make war with Christians, and we will suffer. This is not suffering God's wrath at the tribulation. Revelation talks not just about um, the suffering that will take place of Christians by the beast or Antichrist. It also talks about the suffering and there's much about this suffer, this type of suffering that comes from God on people who are not his. Uh, you go to Revelation 9, 4. Uh, and it says, uh, this is talking about when the trumpets are blown. And again, we'll, we'll talk about all this later. Um, but uh, these locusts are unleashed. Uh, came down upon the earth, were given a power like that of scorpions on the earth. Verse 4, they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And so the wrath of God is poured out not on God's people, but on those who are not God's people. Um, and then if you go to chapter 14, verses 9 and 10, uh, a third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured at full strength into the cup of his wrath. He'll be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. So this this is this is torment poured out by God. Not His people aren't going to suffer it. It'll be those who've accepted the mark of the beast will suffer it. So his people will not suffer that tribulation. Uh, verse uh, Chapter 16, verse 2. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly and painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. Again, this wrath is poured out, this suffering, this, this peril is poured out on those, not on God's people, but on those who 
have the mark of the beast or worship the beast. And so, uh, so anyway, it's just saying that um, that this suffering is going to come. It will be a time um, uh, that the beast will cause suffering, but it's different than the suffering that will be poured out by God on the ungodly. So, um, and and the word is, uh, be faithful even to the point of death. And Jesus says, I'll give you the crown of life. Let me, let me just say two more things. Um, for those who say that, um, that uh, who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, that means uh, the church and the world will be raptured out of the world before the tribulation comes upon the world. Um, if we make the correlation between Revelation 2 and Matthew 13, and if in Matthew 13, the good seed has been sown, the word of God's been sown, it's bearing good fruit, that means souls are coming to, people are coming to Jesus, and if there is bad seed sown amongst that as well, um, so those who don't have a relationship with Jesus are growing up right in the midst of those who do. If it was clear that everything in Scripture was pre-tribulation rapture, it doesn't make sense necessarily that the owner of the field and the wheat, God, Jesus, would say to his servants, leave both the weeds and the wheat alone. First, deal with the weeds after they've full grown. Then deal with God's people after they're full grown. If everything were so clearly pre-tribulation rapture, it seems that this parable would say, get the wheat out first, the church, then deal with the weeds that are left. Just something to think about. Again, I've said from the beginning, I, I, I am not a pre-trib guy. I think we're going to be here. The church is going to be here through the tribulation. I think it's very clear in Scripture. Uh, I think most of what is used to suggest a pre-trib rapture is uh, oftentimes inferred uh, from what the text says. Um, and I could infer many things the other way, too, that we're going to be here through it. So, um, so anyway... Um, Jesus says in, in verse 10 here, if, just be faithful, even to the point of death. Yes, it'll come to that for some of you. He says, and I'll give you the crown of life. The crown of life it was just, it, it, was, it, was, it was a way to, of, of, of putting in contrast uh, the crown of Smyrna. Um, at at the, the temples around, around the mountain of Zeus, uh, we're, we're we're known as the crown of Smyrna. They they it, it it's it's believe it, Zeus had his temple there, um, and the uh, and the temples around the mountain of Zeus kind of look like a crown around the mountain of Zeus. And so w one of the things that we're being told here is I'm I'm going to give you a crown, but it won't be like the crown that you see around the the mountain of Zeus. This is going to be an everlasting crown. Um, verse eleven. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. What's the second death? The second death is the final judgment. It's the lake of fire. It's the eternal separation from God. It's eternal death. And he says, if you overcome, you'll still experience the first death. I mean, you're going to physically die one day. But you'll have nothing to worry about about the second death. Eternal life, eternal crown. It's yours. See, I think oftentimes when we when we when we feel as though the totality of life is on this earth, um, there's a lot to worry about, and there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of fear. But when when life is not just about what happens on this earth, when we're convinced of eternity that is to come, and the security of eternity with God, with Christ in heaven. And a new heaven and a new earth, and that's eternal, um, then it puts things in perspective here in this world. So be faithful. Be faithful. I wish we could get to the church in Pergamum. Um, 
and I may in my Bible study tonight and have to make another video about it for uh, for, for our online Bible study people. Um, but it's going to get pretty, Church and Pergamum, there's a lot to talk about Church and Pergamum. Uh, it's going to be fun to talk about that. But anyway, uh, that is Revelation 2, 8 through 11, the church in Smyrna. I hope it's encouraging to you. Uh, stay faithful.